Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our broadcast today. I'm Pastor Steve Green, and this is Bretton Word of Faith Church. My wife Penny and I pastor here today is January 24th, a Sunday. And the series that we're teaching is the pattern of sound words. Paul spoke not just with sound words, but in a pattern of sound words. And today our message title is An Altered State of Mind. I'm excited about getting to that part of the message where we're talking about an altered state of mind. Our main scripture today is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And it's when our heart is pure and it is in a process of being purified, of course, uh, as our heart is purified, uh, that is when our mind becomes altered. We'll get to that a little more in a short while. The intended result of today's message is that we want to test the reliability of the whiteboard in order to determine if it is uh, dependent if it's accurate, if it's scripturally sound, if we can give our life to the cause that the whiteboard is illustrating. So we want to test the reliability of it. We have a new whiteboard, as you can see behind me, but really it's the same one. It's just um, rearranged a little bit, and it's rearranged for my benefit and possibly for yours too. Uh, the purpose is, is that it'll. It, we want to make it more clearly um, or we want to demonstrate more clearly the scriptures that the whiteboard is based upon so we can be confident of its scriptural basis. Uh, first of all, I want you to look at the bottom. Now you're going to observe there's a lot of wavy, multicolored lines on this whiteboard and I want you to not be distracted by that because we're not going to pay a lot of attention to that. That's not real important for the moment. The main thing that I want you to have a look at is the bottom of the whiteboard. Uh, and along the bottom, there are eight ideas, eight key ideas uh, that simple ideas, very basic ideas that form uh, the, that when taken together, uh, are an expression of the gospel. Now, there's two things I would like for you to observe. Number one is that these eight different simple or basic ideas, what they are, but not only what they are, the sequence that they are in. Uh, <clears throat> just like a sentence has words, obviously, and those words need to be in an order uh, so that the sentence makes sense to us. So, in order for the gospel to be clearly understood, we not only need to understand these eight simple ideas, is, but we need to be able to see how uh, they function in order or how they function in sequence. So we'll have a quick, very quick look at them right now. The first one is that there is a Christ and Jesus is the Christ. He is our authority. Uh, these different, eight different simple ideas we could go into a lot more um, detail on, but for the moment we just want to show, uh, give a brief overview and show the simplicity of them. When, when Jesus was on earth, he spoke words. These words are written down. Uh, so again, a very simple connection between one idea and the next one. He spoke words. When we read these words or hear these words, it gives us our initial knowledge of what uh, Jesus had to say. Now, I'm going to back up for a second. You'll notice that uh, we've entitled this uh, whiteboard as we have the other one. We've entitled it the gospel. And this whiteboard in particular is the gospel to people who have already been saved, people that have already come to Christ, people that are, have already had their sins forgiven, are already in the family of God. Uh, and now uh, we need to live out our faith. Uh, that's what this whiteboard is pertaining to. And so uh, Christ spoke words and now that we know or have an initial knowledge of those words, we have the opportunity from our heart to believe those words. Again, very simple connections from one idea to the next. When I believe those words, a key uh, indicator of how well I believe the words is how well I act upon those words. Uh, that's going to be the fourth uh, simple idea. There's different ways of acting upon the words of Jesus. Uh, in a nutshell, it is righteousness. It's performing uh, the moral instructions that Jesus gave us. It's loving one another. That's going to be the primary 
action of faith. Uh, now the result of that is, and now this is a very interesting one, you'll notice uh, there's different colored arrows here. We're not talking about the curved arrows, which is all of these are curved, but there's a few straight ones along the bottom connecting these ideas. The straight ones are in w two different colors, the green colors and blue colors, which correspond exactly uh, to the use of those colors in the other whiteboard. Green means go. Green is something we can do. Uh, blue is something that we can't do, but when we do what we can do, blue represents what only God can do. And so that's a connection here. And so we get to the fifth one, very interesting. Uh, this one is less obvious. It's not complicated to understand, but it's less well known, is that when we do this action of faith, the result is a purification or a cleansing in our heart that brings us to spiritual maturity. Again, there's more for us uh, to say about that. The result of maturity is that now we become more consistently righteous. There's a different flavor to this, a different quality to it. This is righteousness here too, functional righteousness, and that is functional righteousness. So we have a very interesting uh, connection here with a pure heart in the middle, is that we do righteousness in order to purify our heart in order that we can do righteousness. Now that might seem um, a little odd or perhaps it might not seem intuitively obvious to us that we would do righteousness in order to do righteousness, but we will come back to that. And the result of this is that it produces salvation. Again, the second aspect of salvation in our lives. Salvation, blessing, uh, life, entering His rest, and all of this working together brings glory to God. God is glorified in the earth as a result of us participating in intelligently, accurately uh, in his gospel that he has for us. So those are the eight ideas that, and the sequence that the ideas work in. And that's the main point that we wish for you to get out of the whiteboard today. Now, uh, I will make a brief mention of all of these multicolored wavy arrows. Uh, what they represent is the different ways in which in the Bible, in, in single verses, or sometimes it's a, a short passage of two or three verses, but how the Bible combines and presents these simple ideas in sequence. For example, there are verses that indicate that Jesus spoke words. And, and again, a very simple idea, but this arrow represents that the Bible, there's actual Bible verses, clear verses that indicate there's a connection here, and this is the proper sequence. Jesus is first, his words come second. Uh, and so each of these um, wavy colored lines represent uh, a different way. There's 29 different lines, which represents 20 different, 29 different ways that we can find Bible verses that combine these eight thoughts. Now, sometimes there's only two of the thoughts that are contained in the verse, but if we follow this green line here, it is every single thought is contained in this Bible passage. So that's quite a verse that would contain all eight of those ideas all in sequence. And so again, there's 29 variations. The total number of verses that we have that we're using right now, and no doubt there's more, maybe many more, but we just um, are making note of them as we come across them. Uh, but right now there are 77 different verses that fit into these 29 different combinations. So the what I would uh, ask that you would notice without us going into all of the different um, arrows and which are the verses that correspond to the different arrows, just for the moment to take note of the fact that 77 different verses, uh, all um, supporting these eight different ideas, some in more detail than others, but all supporting these eight ideas, but even, or just as importantly, supporting the sequence in which these um, ideas occur in the Bible. And throughout all of these 77 different verses, the sequence is always going to be the same. And what I would, what I would like you to get from that is that, is that we have a lot of reliability uh, in, this, in this presentation, that there is, um, that there's a consistency and a clarity to the presentation of the gospel as we're endeavoring to present it, that as you become personally familiar with it, not taking my word for it, but as you uh, familiarize with 
yourself with these verses that it gives you a strong basis to believe that A, you understand the gospel and, and B, you can give your life to it, give your heart to it, that it's dependable and it's worth, it's worth the risk. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're that's the point we're trying to get at this is the main point all right uh, understanding that the gospel is the good news the only good plan for our lives and also uh, having a reliable understanding of that gospel uh, our hope is that we are now motivated to believe it and to do it all right so let's go into more detail on these eight basic ideas just to make sure we're understanding uh, them. We say that they're simple, and they are. Um, simple doesn't mean easy. Some of these uh, things we'll be working our whole lives on doing and getting better at doing, but, doing. but what the word simple means is that uh, with a little bit of thought and a little bit of assistance from the Holy Spirit, uh, we should be able to understand it. All of these ideas should be readily understandable to all of us, no matter what our age is unless we're very, very, very young. So uh, the, number, the first one is Jesus is the Christ, and uh, we, we just won't take any time to expand upon that today. Um, it, it's worth expanding on, but we won't take time to do it today. Number two, he has spoken to us in the written scriptures. Uh, we have his words, and they give us initial knowledge of what he has to say. In order to be saved, and we're talking obviously about the second aspect of salvation, we must believe his words. That would also be true in the first aspect of salvation. To believe is to depend upon or rely upon his words in our heart. And now that we get to the human heart, this is one of the potential pitfalls. There can be other beliefs already established in our heart before we get around to the gospel, and they can uh, impede us or get in the way or make it more difficult. Um, so to believe, is, to believe is from our heart, and again, as we mentioned, this can be called faith. Another way of coming at it is this is called repentance. And we notice here that faith is dramatically different than our initial knowledge. Our faith is based on our initial knowledge, but we've gone way deeper now because now we're believing it, we're depending upon it, we're relying upon it, we're taking actions that God has to be faithful to his word or we might be in trouble. Uh, so, so this is a lot, getting a lot deeper with God than simply our initial knowledge was. And now when we rely upon his words in our heart, we will act upon them. And in the language of the Bible, these corresponding actions, there's, there's different ways the Bible refers to it. We can call it obedience. We can call it righteousness. That would be functional righteousness. We can call it loving one another. A phrase that we're using is making relational environments for discipleship. It's about becoming disciples because disciples observe to do everything that Jesus commanded. So these are all different ways in the Bible that these actions are uh, described. So when we do have faith in what Jesus said, we choose to have faith and we choose to put action to that faith, then there is a corresponding uh, release of the power of God producing a supernatural change in us. And this is where the altered state of mind comes in. We literally are changed in how we function, how we think, how we talk, how we act. We become uh, in some ways as if we are a different person. The altered state of mind we're talking about is a very good altered state of mind. Uh, this and there's many different ways that this is referred to in the New Testament. Um, it's called a purity of heart. We're being cleansed. The, the power of God through our faith in action is literally bit by bit cleansing our heart out of all manner of contamination that has found its way in there. Uh, so because we see spiritually with our heart now, this is also the ability to see. It is, uh, as we mentioned, an altered state of mind, an altered state of being. It is called spiritual maturity. It's knowing as we ought to know. Uh, there's, this is a different level of knowing than our initial knowledge. Again, every step we're taking is getting deeper into the things of the Spirit. And so now there's a, a type of knowing that's different than our initial knowing. It's the type of knowing that we know when we can see more clearly uh, the lay of the land spiritually. We understand our life, the issues of our life, the decisions of our life. Uh, another 
word that we can use for this is wisdom. Um, we'll get to that again a little bit later. Christ is being formed in us. We're literally taking on the personality and the characteristics of Jesus Christ. We're doing some of the same things and hopefully more and more, but some of the same things that, that He did on the earth. We're saying the same things. We're acting the same way. We're thinking the same way. Christ is literally uh, functionally being formed in us. This is what this fifth simple idea is all about, of being pure in heart. It, we're another phrase the a biblical phrase is we're being um, established blameless in holiness. A point that I, we've quickly referred to and I'll draw your attention to it again is that this is incremental. Our heart does not go from completely impure to completely pure. In fact, there are probably very few sincere Christians that are completely impure and probably none of us are completely, absolutely 100% pure because it is a step-by-step, stage-by-stage process. Now, also, uh, it's reversible, which maybe you didn't want to hear, but it is the reality. In the same way that steps of faith uh, that are righteousness, functional righteousness, in the very same way that they cleanse our heart, steps of sin contaminate our heart incrementally also. Uh, now, there's pitfalls associated with each of these simple steps. As, as simple as they are to describe, as soon as we release these simple ideas from God upon the human race, we, have, we are able, um, as human beings, we're able to find ways to uh, make it more difficult than what it has to be. Uh, and we mentioned earlier that a typical pitfall is in the heart. It's because, not that we want it to be the case, but that it's very usual that maybe a few, maybe many, maybe big, maybe small, but there are previously resident beliefs in our heart that have to be displaced. And that is more challenging to displace a belief, to, to put a new one in, than it is to have a clean slate and just start believing something from scratch. So, th so that is going to be a pitfall. Uh, here's another pitfall is that the, the key ingredient here is cleansing. This is what gives us a pure heart that, that produces this altered state of mind. And, and if cleansing is necessary, that means I have to admit that my heart is not yet as clean as it needs to be. Uh, and simple, maybe for many people very easy. It's a very necessary step. Uh, for some, there doesn't need to, we don't need to elaborate on it. It's just simple, do it, they're good with it. Uh, for others, that's going to be a challenge because sometimes people don't want to admit that they're not yet as clean as they need to be. They'd like to think, they'd like to pretend would be an accurate word that, no, I'm just perfectly fine. I have a perfectly pure heart. There's nothing, nothing wrong here, nothing to see. Move along, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and and th it's to our advantage if we can admit, all right, I'm in the process of cleansing, then we can participate more fully in it. We would need to admit that we do not yet see as we ought to see. That would mean that some things that seem apparent to us, uh, are God sees them differently than how we see them. Uh, we do not yet know as we ought to know. This is another reality. It's good to have humility with regard to these things. So the sixth uh, simple point or basic point uh, is that, or basic idea, is that as our heart is cleansed incrementally, so then we now, uh, it affects our behavior. And again, it's just step by step, maybe not dramatic overnight, but we become, we grow, we grow into consistently and reliably being righteous. It's now predictable. Instead of hit and miss, here a bit, there a bit, inconsistent, uh, spotty, <laughs> uh, uh, uncertain, people that know you are uncertain how you might react in different situations, you become uh, consistently, predictably, reliably righteous. Uh, and again, it's th that just moves up step by step. So uh, then the result of that is salvation in the second aspect. It is the life of God. It's entering His rest. It's being blessed. It's getting the results we want. Uh, this is what every Christian, I'm sure, wants, is to get good results. Wants to be not just get good results, be full of good results. But what we're looking at in the whiteboard is a process. And as we discussed several weeks ago, we need to be willing 
willing to work the process because it's by the process and, and we're describing that process with these eight simple ideas. Uh, by working the process we progressively come uh, more and more powerfully into the results that we're all looking for. And then the eighth uh, basic idea is that this all brings glory to God. And, and God gets a lot out of it, a lot out of it. He gets a lot of really good advertising. Uh, he looks really good in the process. Uh, we look good in the process. And not only that, but because we're, it, it works through righteousness, is we're being a benefit to other people. We're, at, we're serving the interests of other people more than we're serving our own interests. And in the process of doing that, our interests get more than adequately looked after. They get abundantly looked after. So those are the eight ideas. So let's talk a little bit more about the altered state of mind. I want to use an illustration here. I say I want to use it. I'm actually a little hesitant to use it because it's, it's an illustration of exactly the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, and we don't want to give the wrong thing any advertising, um, but I am tempted to use this illustration and will use it because of how well it communicates the idea of an altered state of mind. And I'm talking about the use of alcohol or the use of THC would be another example, the active ingredient in marijuana. These things uh, produce an altered state of mind. Now the altered state of mind that they produce is also features impaired judgment. The altered state of mind that God produces is um, better judgment, a much better judgment. In fact, it's being able to see, being able to see spiritually, being able to see God. The reason I want to use this example is because when, uh, not uncommonly, when people use alcohol and more than maybe a single drink or, or they get stoned, it, it's a very noticeable, very obvious alteration uh, in their mind. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that it's not just imaginary, uh, but they've done something, they've consumed something that is producing clear and obvious distinctions in how they're acting now. Uh, it, almost as if, maybe in some cases, they're a different person. This is not an unusual thing for people to say to, to other people if they have been drinking or they have been getting stoned. It's, they, they might say something like, you are a completely different person when you're drinking. Maybe some people, you know, um, relax and they laugh more if they've been drinking. Some people get more angry. They're more ready to fight when they've been drinking. But again, these, there's this alteration in personality. And although these examples are illustrating how to do it the wrong way, um, I like the idea of how obvious it is, how distinct it is, how, in some cases, how dramatic uh, it is to have an altered state of mind. And I would like for you to think the same way about uh, having an altered state of mind that comes from God. It produces a very dramatic change, very distinct. We're not talking make-believe. We're not talking imaginary. Uh, we're not exaggerating, but it is a very profound difference that occurs in us as we enter into the altered state of mind on a very positive side. Now, the thing about it is it's very incremental. So because it's slow, we may not notice that it's happening. Other people may not notice it's happening while it's happening, but over a period of time, the results can be very dramatic. That's the point that we're making. Uh, <clears throat> and again, it does not impair our judgment, but rather we are able to make judgments far, far uh, superior to what we would be able to do naturally. So uh, let's compare uh, this altered state of mind to uh, an, a second illustration, uh, compare it to uh, natural maturity, uh, similar to in some ways to spiritual maturity, and in some ways very different two very different things. We don't want to confuse them. Uh, but with natural uh, maturity, let's use the example of employment. Uh, so let's say a person has a job. It could be a young man. This could also apply very easily to an older man as well, but we'll use a young man as an example. He has a job, say he's in his early 20s. Uh, it's a reasonably good paying job. Um, but he has an immature attitude toward it, let's just say. Um, and that immature attitude shows up in different ways. He um, doesn't want to work very hard. He works when he's being inspected, but when he's not being inspected, then he doesn't work so much. Uh, he maybe has a wife at home and children, maybe, that he's providing for. Um, but he, 
he, he resents his job. On one hand, he likes the paycheck, but he resents having to get up. He resents having to go to work. He resents having to receive instructions from somebody else. He might stay up too late. He might be getting into an altered state of mind on the night before and staying up too late and then having a hangover the next day and maybe arriving late or calling in sick. Maybe, again, he has an adversarial attitude toward the boss. The boss is his enemy, his adversary. He needs to trick or, or, or skirt things or do things behind the boss's back. He doesn't see the boss as a partner uh, in business, but rather as an opponent. Uh, now, these, all, all these things are going to impact the nature of the work that he does. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm talking about relationship with the boss. Obviously, the, the personality of the boss is going to have something to do with that as well. So, let's say over time though, as he is doing this job, he isn't quitting the job, he isn't getting fired, he's managing to hang on, but as he's doing this job, um, some years go by, two, three, four years, and in the process, while he's doing the job, he becomes more mature. He begins to see he's got responsibilities. He needs to take these responsibilities more seriously. He has people depending upon him. He has a family. He wants to live up to those responsibilities. He wants to earn the respect, not only of his family, but also of his co-workers, of the people he answers to, his supervisors at work. So there's a transition that happens. It probably doesn't happen overnight. It happens gradually, but he comes to a place of greater maturity. After he is now uh, entering this greater maturity, again, step by step, uh, he is now doing the same work. In some respects, the work hasn't changed, but the attitude is completely different. He shows up on time. He gets to bed at a reasonable time of night. He sees his boss more as somebody he wants to help. Uh, they help each other. Uh, if the boss succeeds, he succeeds. If he succeeds, the boss succeeds. Uh, just a different attitude, so there's a different quality even though a lot of the work is the same work. That's an illustration that we're using of spiritual maturity, which uh, this illustration uh, uh, <coughs> is similar to spiritual maturity in the sense that it is actions that lead us to maturity uh, in the spiritual case. And then as we become more mature spiritually, we end up doing many of the same actions, but on a higher level, more dependably, more reliably. There's a different attitude. Uh, um, there's a different uh, integrity to how we're going about what our responsibilities. And I'm not talking now natural, I've transitioned to spiritual maturity, and we're not talking about our performance at work, although that would be included with many other things, but we're now talking about our performance in the kingdom, the things that we're doing for God. It's obedience to His Word. Once we come to maturity, then we become much more dependable in our performance of righteousness. We could compare uh, spiritual maturity to the threads in a garment. I'm wearing a shirt right now that is, uh, it's a fabric, it's woven from threads, and, imagine, and it's a purple shirt. Imagine if um, there was some black, say we took one thread out of this, that would be hard to do, I don't know how you do that, but just for the sake of discussion, let's say we took one thread, one purple thread out of the shirt and inserted a black thread instead. Um, Probably, uh, I wouldn't notice it, um, maybe you wouldn't notice it, uh, not at a glance anyway, uh, because it's just one thread amongst hundreds or maybe a thousand or thousands of purple threads. It might not even be noticeable, uh, but it's a change. And then if we added another thread, black thread, and added another black thread, and if we were consistent with it day by day, uh, month by month, year by year, adding black threads, taking out purple threads, then uh, along the way, then the shirt would start to look more black than it was purple, and eventually it would be completely black. That would be an illustration of spiritual maturity happening. It does not happen overnight. So biblical descriptions of this altered state of mind, it, different ways it's described in the Bible, and, and I have a fairly, fairly complete list here, but no doubt there's other ways that we could find also. This is called being pure in heart. Uh, and the main scripture we have for today is Matthew 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So very interesting connections there. If we are pure in heart, it, there's a connection 
from that to being blessed, which is one of, these are two ideas on our whiteboard. To be pure in heart is one idea, to be blessed is another. Here's a verse that connects those two. Uh, if I'm pure in heart, then I will experience a higher degree of blessing in my life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's another connection between uh, being pure and being able to see. We see spiritually with the eyes of our heart. The cleaner my heart is, the better I'm able to see. So pure in heart is a way of describing it. Ability to see, having a conscience. Uh, the Greek word for conscience is sunidesis, which is seeing together with, seeing together with God. Having a divine conscience is when God is participating in my conscience and I'm learning how to see things as He sees them. Praise the Lord. That's, that's an exciting idea that we could see things as God sees them. So, so this ability to see is part of a pure heart, having a heightened or a divine conscience. It's knowing things as we ought to know them. Now there's a much, we know things because we can see them. That's a different level of knowing, uh, a much deeper level of knowing than simply reading and understanding naturally the words that Jesus said. Uh, that's the, our initial knowledge. This is the knowledge that we really need to have. It's having our senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Uh, it's being able to, it's knowing the things we ought to do, knowing the things more clearly that we do not want to do them. And because we see them so clearly, it becomes much easier to do them. It isn't just knowing in a natural, heady kind of way, well, I know I shouldn't do that. The Bible says I've heard, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it isn't that. It's seeing the ramifications, seeing the consequences, seeing the reasons why. It is, it's, it's being made so obvious to us, we don't even want to do the wrong thing. It, it's abhorrent. It's, um, it's just detestable. It's, it's disgusting. <laughs> we don't want to do it. It's it, much easier to resist temptation from a pure heart. Uh, holiness is another word to describe this attitude of heart. Sanctification, uh, the Bible calls it being established blameless in holiness or, or being holy and without blemish in another place. It is what wisdom is. Wisdom isn't just an accumulation of uh, initial knowledge. Uh, it's not an accumulation of head knowledge, but wisdom is being able to see the right way to apply the knowledge that we have. It's not a natural thing, it's a spiritual thing. I suppose there is a natural wisdom, but we're talking about spirit. Suppose there is natural wisdom, we're talking about spiritual wisdom. Uh, perfection is a word that's used, not perfection in the sense of never doing anything wrong, but again, becoming reliably righteous. Maturity is another word, full age. Transformation is a word used in the Bible to describe this. It's we're being transformed or Christ is being formed in us, another phrase. We become partaker of the divine nature. Again, it's not overnight, it's not just black and white, but it's by degree. Uh, we, the love of God is being poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit, another biblical way of describing this. We're zealous or enthusiastic about good works because we see so clearly how important they are. We're making our eye good, the eye being our spiritual eye, which is our heart. Or in the words of Jesus, we're also making the tree good because Jesus uh, compares our heart to a tree and a tree that produces good fruit. Uh, so making the tree good, Jesus said you need to make the tree good. This is what we're talking about. We're making the eye good, the heart good, the heart pure. Biblical descriptions of an altered state of mind. So another scripture uh, that I want to bring to your attention, uh, John 8, 31 and verse, verses 31 and 32. I think many of us are familiar with this, but it's amazing when we look closely at this verse. We might have quoted it in the past. Uh, again, it's, it's fairly widely known, fairly widely used, but it's amazing when we look at what it's actually saying. Let's read what Jesus said in John 8, verses 31 to 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I've even heard this verse quoted in a very natural setting. Um, people not claiming to be Christians at all, or not trying to state a, a Christian truth, but they've heard this and they're repeating it, and they're just talking about natural truth. Um, that uh, they believe that just being telling the truth 
naturally it will ultimately set you free. And so then they'll quote this verse. But let's have a close look at what Jesus said. He said, if you abide in my word, uh, we understand from other scriptures that abiding in the word doesn't mean that we're just reading it. It doesn't just mean that we're thinking about it. It means that we're doing it. Uh, so if you abide in my word, you are my, di you are my disciples indeed. That fits with what Jesus said in Matthew 28. He said, make disciples, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And so uh, the idea of a disciple is somebody who doesn't just know the word of God, but is somebody who is learning to do the word of God. So he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. So notice when knowing the truth comes, knowing the truth, there is a certain knowledge of truth in to begin with, because otherwise how could you abide in Him or abide in His Word if you didn't know what His Word said? Uh, so there's that initial knowledge, but then there's the other knowledge, the more in-depth knowledge, the more spiritual knowledge that comes after doing it, which is exactly the sequence that we see on the whiteboard. He said, if you abide in my Word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Let's look at that on the whiteboard. If you abide in my Word, if you, well, this is His Word, so this is Christ speaking. If you uh, abide in my Word, which means that in order to abide in it, we need to believe it and act upon it. If you abide in my Word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free, which is our second aspect of salvation or life or entering His rest or blessing. So that's an amazing verse, two verses that... that um, encompasses almost the entirety of our eight thoughts. There's six of them that are included in those two short verses. So, praise the Lord. So, we'll conclude with this, that we have, according to the gospel, according to the written word of God, as we're endeavoring to graphically display, whether it's this whiteboard or the previous whiteboard, uh, we have a mission from God. There's a calling upon our lives, and this calling is precious. It is purchased for us by the blood of Jesus. It is an honor. It is a privilege for us to be able to rise up and answer this call upon our life. It's to see the Christ. It's to hear His words. It's to believe in Him, to get past whatever hard issues we have, to persevere, to have endurance, to, to push through obstacles, to believe His words, to do what it takes, uh, to believe and act upon those words, in order that our heart would be purified, we would enter an altered state of mind, becoming more like Jesus Christ, performing righteousness, righteousness more dependably and reliably, and therefore experiencing fully His salvation in our lives, the full range, the full smorgasbord of benefits provided to us through Jesus Christ and bringing glory to God. This is an amazing calling that we have in our life. There's nothing in life that remotely touches it, nothing that addresses the, our concern concerns, uh, our needs, the way that this gospel addresses our needs, nothing that makes us more pleasing to God. There is nothing that helps us uh, pr uh, serve the needs of other people near as well as performing this gospel. This gospel is the key to life. It's the only way to live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father other than through me. That's referring not only to initially coming to Christ, but also how we come to Christ throughout our lifetime. Praise the Lord. And and so then we have a simple mission in life, and that mission is to uh, perform functional righteousness. It is to do what is necessary in order for God to produce the supernatural result of an altered state of mind for us, which means that we make disciples. We be disciples, we make disciples. They're, they're really the same thing, which means we obey Him, we keep His commandments, we practice righteousness, we love other people, we make relational environments for discipleship. That's where the, the rubber hits the road here. There's a calling for all of us in all of our relationships and all of our, uh, throughout our days, whenever we're contacting people, to be conscious of the fact that God wishes to live and express Himself through us. And that is by reaching out, by loving people, and making these relational environments for dis discipleship. That is our mission, and our vision then is as we do this, the inevitable consequence is, is God will produce the abundant life in our lives, and this will bring glory to God. And this is what we see uh, our outcome being 
this is what we see our earthly experience being as we overcome everything. Many are the tribulations of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. This is our victory. He always causes us to triumph in Christ. And so this is, this is both our mission. Our mission is to, is to love people, love God and love people. And our vision is to what we see, where we see this going is that we help other people have the life of God and we enjoy the life of God also. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today. This is an overview of the whiteboard and uh, we, will, we will be, we mentioned earlier, 77 verses. Uh, two of them we mentioned today are just one of them. And, uh, and then um, Matthew 5, 8 is actually not one of the 77 verses, but it, it helps describe what we're talking about. But we will be looking into more verses to increase the confidence we have in this calling that we have on our lives as we go. Thank you for joining us. We love and pray for you all the time. All right, have a great day.